software has never been more streamlined. Visit indeed.com slash credit. You've heard AM, you've heard FM. Now, tune into DM Radio, the world's longest running show about data. Each week, host Eric Cavanaugh interviews the brightest minds in the world of information management. Want to be on a show? Send an email to info at dmradio.biz. Now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the longest running show in the world about data. It's called DM Radio. Yes, indeed, yours truly here, Eric Cavanaugh. Excited to talk to another group of experts, a real all-star cast today, folks, on one of the hottest topics. It's really driving the information economy, and that topic is analytics. We're going to talk about fostering virtuous circles using analytics, staying on top of what's going on in your organization, a tremendous amount of innovation in this space these days, the cloud, of course, is looming large. Uh, and Microsoft has been kind of the sleeper in this industry the last few years. And all of a sudden, they came out on top because they're just everywhere, because everyone has these technologies. So we have lots of different ways of doing things uh, today. We'll be talking to several guests, Kenya Davis from the Digital Analytics Association, I think that's what it's called, as well as uh, Kimberly Mosley from that organization. Our buddy Tony Ayaz is with Scuba Analytics these days. And we're also going to hear from Paul Gunther uh, and his company, which is uh, doing some interesting work as well. So I'll just start off and say that uh, analytics is everywhere these days. It's baked into so many different solutions. You have embedded analytics, some people call that, so you can understand customer profitability or likelihood of a sales to close, lead scoring. It's all over the place. It's in operations, it's in sales, it's in marketing. The marketing world in particular is very interesting because we have this uh, issue of third-party cookies going away. So what are we going to do about that? You know, talk about pulling the rug out from underneath a marketer. Boy, that is just a huge change in how you have to get your job done. So you'll see a lot more effort on first-party data, for example, really leveraging that as much as possible. You'll see uh, some efforts around governance too, like privacy, what's going on in the privacy world. Big deal, lots of stuff going on, of course, the EU with the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Big fines if you do not honor the privacy, big fines if you don't honor someone's right to be forgotten, as they call it. And I'm a big fan on what I call the right to be respected. And what I mean by that is every company that uses your data should respect that it's using your data. And if they bake that mindset into their day-to-day -day lives, well, guess what? They're probably not going to run afoul of any of these various regulations and things are going to go okay. With that, let's bring in our first guest, Kenya Davis, calling in from Charlotte, North Carolina, I believe, and DAA. Yeah, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, how you use analytics or work with companies to, to better their analytics to get virtuous circles. Yes. Um, so I... I serve on the board of the DAA. I also work for Microsoft and my previous role was um, an associate director of experimentation for um, a digital analytics consulting company called Evolytics. Um, and so there is quite a bit of um, uproar around this topic and how do you how you drive that governance and how do you um, adapt very quickly to um, the regulations that are coming out that are very, very justified. Um, and so uh, that's a bit about me. And as far as the DAA, we we strive to be that, um, that community for analytics and be that hub for um, looking for those best practices within our space and serving as that unbiased voice um, within analytics. Yeah, bias. Got to watch out for bias, right? It can get baked in. It's in the data a lot of times. So you have to be careful about the data that you use to train algorithms, for example. Exactly. But uh, you mentioned a couple of interesting points there. And the governance, you know, it's, it was kind of an afterthought until a few years ago, it seems to me. And we talked about data governance. We talked about it 20 years ago. Doesn't mean a whole lot was happening. But now I think part of the reason why we talk about it is because it can happen. It's a lot easier to bake in some guardrails with some of these cloud solutions, it seems to me. But what's your what's your take on the importance of governance and how well we're able to exact governance, if you will, in today's world? Yeah, governance is probably my favorite area, um, and it does cause the the most uproar within <laughs> um, any organization when you have just office politics and whatnot. And I think one of the biggest things for um, for driving true governance is having 
the proper representation for the groups that make major decisions for the ones that are using the data for those that are impacted by it. Um, and additionally, just ensuring that there are steps in which a, a single person can't be the, the sole responsibility for a failure. So it's not just about holding people accountable, but ensuring that they um, can do their job comfortably and know that there's some type of checks and balances within there to um, to allow them to excel um, and to make little mistakes here and there. We're going through a lot of changes in the analytics world. So I think a lot of people are tiptoeing around um, governance because there's a lot of insecurities around what that should be. Um, one of the other things that that I like to tie in with governance is nomenclature and having that that um, clear idea of how you organize yourself, how you measure everything, how do you come up with those strategies and plans that um, that allow you to to scale and grow quickly, but mm -hmm. um, ensure that every step of the way, everything has been thought out to some degree. Um, so yeah, I I can go on for days about governance. Yeah. But. Well, you know what's interesting too is the, is the deeper you bake governance guardrails into your platform, the less you have to worry about things, and the less the individual analyst has to concern him or herself. And that's what you want, right? You want the analyst to have what seems like complete free play in terms of slicing and dicing, whatever they get access to. So typically you control it at the access point, right? Whether or not someone should have access to this data set or that. And the, the more that's just baked in as opposed to bolted on, the better off you're going to be, right, Kenya? Yep. And I think also the, I like that you brought up about the analysts and allowing them to, you know, basically do their job and feel comfortable with what they need to do and, and have access to the data. Um, as, as you think of governance from every layer, that's also allowing them to play around with the data and, and know that there is some type of structure in every layer that, um, that occurs before um, it gets to the manipulation stage. So um, there's definitely multiple um, aspects to governance and it, 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 it exists in all stages of the development cycle. Yeah, that's a good point too. Like even testing data and things of that nature, you have to know who should have access to these things. And the good news is that I think a lot of the data catalog technologies have really come a long way mm -hmm. in the last five years and our ability to discover data and define potentially sensitive data sets and then flag them or protect them is so much better than it was. I mean, the fact that you can scan a whole information landscape and come back and get some pretty meaningful reports about which data sets are where, that's very helpful. And we didn't really have that until a few years ago, right? Exactly, exactly. It's definitely, um, I think there's this, this need for um, having those hubs for your data and for being able to access it and manipulate it in different ways. Um, and there's, there's so much technology that's up and coming, especially in the MarTech area, um, as marketers need access to, to data they didn't need before. Um, right. So it's a definitely a scary space for them um, I don't want to isolate them from like us or them, but I definitely think for um, the the empowerment that they need to do their job, these tools are definitely driving that confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And let's uh, bring in our next guest. We've got Tony Ayaz waiting out there from Scuba Analytics. And Tony, uh, we've talked about privacy and governance, and these are some pretty important issues these days. I heard that uh, Facebook was saying they might pull Facebook and Instagram from Europe because of all these different data requirements, which, you know, I thought to myself, is that a promise or a threat? But uh, Tony, tell us a bit about Scuba Analytics and what you're working on these days. Yes, uh, thanks again for having me. So we are a digital uh, data platform. We really focus on uh, a few areas that is oriented around customer and product analytics. And with by saying customer and product analytics, you can't leave privacy separated um, from that conversation because it connects to how customers are using the product all the way down to private information. So we provide a single um, platform that addresses the needs of getting all sorts of uh, digital uh, insights from a customer and product analytics perspective but also conforming it in a way that you can also manage and deal with these, some of these complex um, regulations that are coming in. And the, one of the ways that we do that with customers like Microsoft, Salesforce, Asana, or even Comcast 
is that we allow the, them to use our software in their cloud of choice. So we're not a SaaS where you send data out to us. Mm. You, everybody today has an Azure and an AWS or GCP cloud environment. And I kind of call it the reverse of going on-prem days, right? Everybody talks about going to the cloud. Well, we're going to the cloud. I'm not denying that or disputing that. But I think people are just saying, well, right, I'm going to use it in the cloud as my data center versus me actually physically managing it. And so with companies that have millions of users and subscribers or, and lots of data, having that control over their data is really important to them. And now with, with the privacy world, what's happening is what we see is that, you know, you used to have visualization tools that you could integrate and send your data out to. That works, but you're leaving a lot of room for error in regards to privacy and how you protect that information. So we provide a single closed system that you can, every query or every insight, whether it's internal or external access to information has a full audit trail capability. And we don't access any of your data unless the customer gives you or the customer gives us permission in terms of accessing that data. But ultimately, the platform was really designed for specifically for real time data. And what I mean by that is every customer interaction that's live on a mobile app or a website or maybe an IoT device. It's capturing that time series data. That's the kind of what it is. It's all the timestamps that that creates that mm -hmm. creates that fingerprint that then we map to customer and product journeys and then mapping it to what your privacy kind of guidelines are or how you need to address that. Uh, the company, um, again, has been around for about six, year, six plus years, um, headquartered out of the, the Bay Area. Um, and, um, and so we're really excited about kind of tackling this problem that everybody's facing. And we've been dealing with it with our customers constantly, but the new regulations that are coming up, it's not just about GDPR, I like to point out, it's, it's, it's a component of GDPR, which is the EU boundary guidelines. Mm -hmm. So this is about data collection now, right? So there's one thing about how you do things around uh, limiting, but collecting the data is the main cul culprit as, uh, in regards to at least the EU boundary guidelines. Because a lot of companies, for example, that are abroad today may have AWS or Azure instance, in country, but then they are also able to run the analytics, let's say out of, out of Los Angeles. Well, that's a no-no moving forward, right? The country, the data has to stay in that country and there's mm. just no way that you can share that personal information outside of those countries. So that's gonna get tightened down. And so what, where we fit into that is not only where the, country, the data can be in that country of choice and run the analytics for product or customer insights, but more importantly, you can lock down the personal information and do cross country or cross server environment queries without being exposed to the personal information. And that, that's going to be really exciting um, area for us uh, in the foreseeable future. Yeah. So from an architectural perspective, the data on someone in a European country is going to stay there. And if you're trying to understand overall customer behavior, for example, you would do the processing for that data in that country, in that instance, and do the processing in, in another country in that instance. And then you can kind of mix and match the, the now anonymized or aggregated information in your environment. Is that right? Correct, correct. And the big thing is that there's a lot of solutions that do similar things like that. If some of your audience might, members might be listening to this, is that the difference between that is there's a lot of stop, collect, stop, collect, stop, share, push this data, move this data around. And that's the problem with the whole of challenges today. This mm -hmm. is a one complete system. Think of it as a toll booth you're going through. All your data, all your processing, all the queries, whoever's accessing, it, it's going through a single system. So it's easier to track that. And that single system, by the way, is within your control. It's mm -hmm. not out on a SaaS platform that you have to push the data out to. Yeah, that's another pretty big trend that I'm seeing, which is very interesting, right? Where you're getting more and more tools that live inside of these environments. You, you, you patch them into AWS or Google Cloud Platform or whatever. So now you've got your domain um, experience, you've got your expertise, et cetera, around this particular space, but you can grab other tools to help you manage it that go inside your environment, right? Exactly, inside of your environment. And also I think it's a, uh... I mean, not to bring politics into this, but if you look at like what's happening in Ukraine and China and all the, the stuff that we saw in the news, right? 
it's also a competitive edge for, for any company in any country where they're at, if that, right? So if you have to comply with these laws and then you can do business, but the way to your point that it's designed now is like sending the data out to a SaaS or different environments moving around, it's just not going to scale and you're going to be limited in what you can do in those countries. And, you know, there's a lot of competitors within those, those environments ready to, to jump on those opportunities. Hmm. That's fascinating stuff. I mean, watching the cloud evolve, and you know, speaking of Microsoft, I, I often joke that uh, I think it's a little bit ironic that we can thank Microsoft for saving us from a monopoly of AWS, <laughs> right? Because AWS has got way out front and they're still dominating. I think I saw a stat the other day, they're like roughly 50% of all cloud revenue is going through AWS and all the other guys are kind of climbing up. But uh, Google and Microsoft in particular are both rising. Is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, I think that if you're a enterprise enterprise company again with lots of data and like say millions of subscribers at a global basis we tend we see customers using both azure and aws however our basis of where we see a lot more happening where it is around azure because brad smith the chief legal officer at microsoft is really you know leading the charge that's publicly on his blog out there that's basically says look whatever these laws are we're going to go 10 steps above it right wow. and and we're looking at that roadmap of how we're going to provide our solution and so i think microsoft has done a very conscious effort to think through uh, how customers want to control their data how they want to actually access it and be involved especially when it comes to enterprise businesses whereas if you look at aws Again, great technology, obviously a very popular platform, but it's almost kind of designed for a different type of market. Maybe it's more of a consumer subscription business where small to medium sized businesses and startups have signed up and they need their platform, they need their analytics, their whole plethora of capabilities that they have versus the Azure platform actually allows companies to a little bit more neutral choice of the types of tools they want to use to support them. Hmm. That's very interesting. And uh, you know, on-prem is not going away anytime soon either. So you're going to have these hybrid multi-cloud environments. Architecture is just going to be absolutely crucial to being able to, to handle that, right? If you have uh, an archaic architecture, you're going to be stumbling left and right and just forever behind the eight ball, forever just trying to throw band-aids on things, et cetera. And that's just not a doable situation. And you know, maybe for the round table, we can kind of dive into a fairly popular topic in cloud migration, which is really thinking through your business processes, your business models, what you're doing, what you can do in the cloud, what you still want to do on-prem, because lift and shift is, is really not the ideal scenario. You see a lot of companies doing that, but that's not taking full advantage of the cloud and of cloud native approaches, cloud native technology. That's, I think, the future where we really want to go. But lots and lots of companies need to find a way to get up in the cloud. You got to be careful about how you do that because you don't want to wind up straddling multiple clouds and your on-prem environment and really not having a handle on any of that. You're going to be, again, just solving all sorts of uh, fires showing up on your, on your, uh, in your email every single day. Well, folks, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. You're listening to DM Radio. What if you could own a piece of the future? What if you could build your next castle, not on sand, but on the bedrock of a modern blockchain ecosystem? <coughs> All right, guys, one down, three to go. That was great. Uh, let, let's see. Uh, it's very interesting stuff, Tony. You're always doing cool stuff, man. I don't know how you pull it off, but. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Kimberly, Mosley, you're up next. So anywhere in particular you want to start? Anything I can throw over to you to get the ball rolling? Um, well, we can go back to the data privacy piece and GDPR. I can tie that back to some of the work that our task forces are doing on privacy and ethics of data um, and tie that yeah. back to volunteer. I like to always mention how when you bring multiple companies together, bring that mind share together, you're mm -hmm. able to really define things much better. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that Tony was talking about are some of the things that um, that task force has been talking about um, as it relates to um, data being slow getting through the pipe and as it relates to um, the borders that the EU is looking for on where mm -hmm. my personal data lives. So let's let's do that one. OK, that sounds good. I love the ethics conversation. That's always a big one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Paul, you'll be batting clean up here. You can comment on anything anyone else has heard. Tell me again, it's a business media group, or what is it called again? 
You're on mute. You're on mute, Paul. Sorry about that. That's all right. um, it's Knowledge Hub Media. Knowledge Hub Media. Company. Knowledge yep. Hub Media. Yeah. Um, and I, I can actually speak just a little bit more on on GDPR and honestly how how it has affected us. But because we deal with business data and we're not dealing with as much personal data, PII, um, mm-hmm. we're we're not held to the same standards uh, with regard to a lot of these regulations and directives, which is makes things a bit easier for us but um you know they they're definitely still uh significant enough and then i guess um maybe as a bit of a change up to talk more about the business side uh because we do not deal with consumers at all um hmm. we deal with people on contacts but they're all um you know professionals and so it's a bit different um no, that's interesting well, what's kind of interesting is in, in a way you and, and tony are doing similar things in that you're tracking behavior on a platform and just the customer journey, if you will, and trying to ascertain at what point is the highest likelihood that they're going to buy this technology or that technology. And, and Tony, if I understand it correctly, you're also tracking the behavior of, of individuals who are in this network. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Like user intent is looking at the, the, uh, the journeys, right? If I and I and the way we do it is kind of uh, connect and enrich these sources so you can predict those outcomes, right? Because if it's of a single data source, it's hard to do that, and you do manually can go do this after. But my favorite, the best one I like is like a lot of these survey stuff that you go in. It's like, how did you like my service? Well, in the world of subscribers, if I have to type in how I like your service, somebody's looking at that thirty days from now, you've lost the business. Right? <laughs> and so. So it's kind of has to really come in and that's how you can understand the intent. Like we have, for example, um, uh, telco subscribers, right? Or excuse me, telco customers that are looking at, hey, did you pay your cable? Did you connect the users? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, all right, we're coming back, hold on. Call me right now at 800-245-1375. 800-245-1375. That's 800-245-1375. 800-245-1375. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks. Welcome back to DM Radio. Your host here, Eric Cavanaugh, talking to an all-star cast. We heard from... Uh, Kenya Davis of, the, of DAA, and uh, also we heard from Tony Ayaz of Scuba Analytics in the first segment. Next up, we have Kimberly Mosley, also of DAA. Kimberly, tell us a bit about yourself and what you're working on these days, and uh, and I guess in particular this whole concept about ethics. You've got some folks who are really uh, working hard to to better understand the ethics of using data. Tell us a bit about that. Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Um, The DAA is a personal membership organization for people that are in the digital analytics space. So it's a community, if you will, of people that face these kinds of challenges every day. Um, One of the really cool things about being a part of a community like ours is that you can bounce your ideas off of one another. We have a task force, for example, that is looking at privacy and ethics um, as it relates to the work that our folks are doing. And even though when you're working in an organization, you might have other uh, digital analytics colleagues that you can bounce ideas off of, but when you're a part of a task force, uh, like the one that we put together at DAA, you're able to bring in thought leadership from all different kinds of sectors, right? All different kinds of organizations are coming together on that task force, bringing their ideas to the table. Um, and what, what we're excited about is that we believe that that's giving us some of the, the best information Um, we're able to build uh, what we hope are best practices for our industry. Um, That task force is looking right now, for example, at um, consent management and uh, cookies and um, how well is the software forgetting me? Um, Mm -hmm. And if it forgets me, then the next time I come, do I have to say no all over again, forget me again? So Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is not the, there's, there are not necessarily easy answers for some of these um, conundrums. And this is a, a great group uh, to come together and, and noodle over it by bringing some uh, great thought leaders from various different organizations. 
Yeah, I really, I appreciate that a lot. And I think you're exactly correct. It helps to get multiple different perspectives at the table to kind of sort through these issues that we're all going to have to deal with. And you know, it seems to me one of the reasons why the ethics conversations are happening as much as they are right now is because of the pervasiveness of the technology, but also because of artificial intelligence, because now we're actually giving access to of data, not just to people, but to machines and to algorithms to train different models, right? And so that all winds up showing up somewhere in the results of what the algorithm does, right? So do you think that the, the prevalence and the sort of growing use of AI is also driving this ethical conversation? Absolutely. Um, as part of our annual conference, we had a speaker come and speak to us about some of the biases that can creep into the algorithms. Um, one of the things the DAA is very proud of is that we have an anti-racism initiative uh, that's very important to our organization. Um, and part of that is a recognition of the algorithms are influenced by the people creating them. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you have diversity, uh, diverse representation in how the algorithms are created, and you need to be mindful of biases that can creep into those algorithms. So mm -hmm. that's another example of how when the community comes together, you get great thought leadership and great uh, better understanding of how best to interact with the data. So yes, biases in algorithms is something that you need to be careful of, uh, something that you need to be aware of. Um, and as we, as AI becomes more prevalent, that is definitely something that our folks will be able to help with. Yeah, and I think it's going to take some time and uh, people, I think, in the industry know that uh, for any kind of predictive model, you have to constantly stay on top of it because behaviors change and uh, ethical standards change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm pretty encouraged by the amount of effort being put into these ethical discussions because let's face it, uh, in, in the US here, it's been the wild, wild west for a long time with data. I mean, th sure. think about the amount of personal data and other data, shopping data, et cetera, that's being brokered from this company to that company, over to this company. It's insane. I, I saw a company at uh, the uh, MarTech conference before the whole pandemic hit, I guess it was like August of 19. And he said they have detailed, highly detailed records on a hundred million consumers in the United States. Highly, like That's what amazing. kind of shoes you buy, when you buy them, what stores you've bought from, mm -hmm. you know, the data is everywhere these days. So we do need to be responsible. And I think the companies that, that are not responsible, whether well, the ones who wind up in the bad headlines, right? Yeah, exactly. And I don't think any company wants to be one of those companies, right? You don't want to be on the front page of the newspaper. No. Or on the on the radio, so no, that's right. So it's an opportunity for you to have some of those kinds of thought leadership discussions uh, with other colleagues that are uh, facing some of those same challenges, and hear and maybe have those aha moments uh, with your colleagues before you end up on the newspaper. Right. Well, and also when you get these industry consortiums, you get people coming together from different companies in the same industry, from different industries. But data is a very horizontal thing. And data management is very horizontal. Everyone is doing it. Everyone has to do it. And uh, you know, I think that it really pays dividends to stay on top of that and to foster a culture of analytical awareness, right? Do, do folks have classes or sessions along those lines of trying Absolutely. to focus on culture? Because it's a very nebulous thing, right? What can you say about advice on how to foster a positive culture for data awareness? I think that's more important than ever, you know, with the what are they calling it? The great resignation. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is that employees are taking a step back and really paying more attention to the culture of the organization that they're going to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So it is for organizations to really pay attention to not only what we do, but why we do what we do. Why is it important to us? What do we stand for? Um, and making sure that their staff, their employees know what the culture is all about so that or so that an employee can make a good decision about where they want to land, where they want to be, what they want to be a part of. Um, even though uh, I'm an, you know, I might be an analyst and I'm looking at data and I'm, I'm ferociously curious about what the data is going to show me, I'm also an individual and I'm concerned about my privacy. So as I'm working with the data, I want to make sure that I'm doing that in a responsible way. We were, uh, Tony was talking earlier about being a uh, 
having guardrails and making sure that as I'm being ferociously curious, because that's what digital analysts are, they're ferociously curious, I like um, that. but I have the guardrails. I have the, you know, the framework of, of what I know is going to be the best practices. And that's what the DAA is all about, helping organizations and individuals understand the best practices. Yeah, I love this ferociously curious. Yes. Uh, I think that hits the nail on the head because you really want to know. And we all have gut instincts, but until you start looking at the data, you know, you're really not being responsible and trying to understand what's actually happening. Because something is always going to surprise you at any data set, any an, an analysis that you run. Mm -hmm. I've found that there's always something, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, that will surprise you, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. There have been many times that you'll be poking about and then something all of a sudden pokes its head up. Like, where did that come from? And, <laughs> and it, it's always a surprise, right? Where did it come from? Yeah, well, that's where governance comes into play and, uh, and lineage and things of that nature, and knowing mm -hmm. where it came from, who touched it, who can use it. And the beautiful thing about the cloud is that all of this stuff is just baked in now of who logged in at what time, which system did, did they touch, all that information is captured. I mean, it kind of was in the on-prem world, but it was harder to get to. You needed mm -hmm. access to this system or that system. But now in, in this cloud-enabled world, everyone has access to the same platforms pretty much. So I yeah. think that's standardizing, but yeah, good and stuff. It's a right? lot that's easier, uh, I would say, prem-based. It was, it was available, but somebody had to really stop and do it. And it wasn't really high enough priority most often for us to right. stop and do it. <laughs> ah, yes, priorities. They do come into play in terms of what gets <laughs> done and what doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's yeah. bring in our, our final guest here. We've got Paul Gunther. He's been waiting very patiently in the wings from Knowledge Hub Media. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you are fostering virtuous circles with analytics. Sure. Um, so with Knowledge Hub Media, um, we're essentially a data processing and technology services platform, um, but we're doing it on the B2B side. So we're focused on working with business and IT professionals, decision makers, um, rather than consumers. Um, to that end, some of the things that we've talked about thus far, um, GDPR, some of the other regulations that have been put into place, um, they've impacted us fairly significantly, um, especially with, with EMEA, um, Europe and our email lists having to kind of ask hundreds of thousands of people to re-opt in, resubscribe right. um, to where, you know, most of them do not. Um, and, and trying to, to kind of rebuild that side of things from scratch because we do, we do a lot of uh, targeting in Europe. Um, at the same time, we don't work with a ton of PII, so personally identifiable information. Um, really, the only PII that we have is, is a person's name, their business email address, which can be considered PII because it generally has a name or an initial in there, mm -hmm. um, the phone number and, and you know, IP addresses, uh, which are questionable you know, now in any circle. Um, so we don't deal with a ton of PII. And so we're not held to all of the same standards in that regard, but we still have to do everything um, correct with regard to, to opt-in and consent. Um, one of the big things in GDPR is everyone knows is, is granular consent. You know, you used mm -hmm. to just be able to put out a blanket statement with a checkbox, you know, I accept all the terms, which means everybody on earth can email me, call me, show up <laughs> at my house, whatever, right? And you can't do that anymore. It's got to be granular. It's got to be Knowledge Hub Media can email me, but they can't call me. The, the client can email me, but can't call me. Um, and so making sure that we're, we're compliant, we're not bundling things, um, and that we're also offering people, of course, the ability to withdraw consent at any time for any reason, also on a granular level. So the, the, the privacy and the compliance thing has, has impacted us, but I would say much less so than a company that's focused on consumer data because we just don't have much of it. Yeah, right. Well, and you're also um, focusing on this intent data, which is a very interesting space. What does this per person intend to do at this point in time? And if you get that right, you can have tremendous results, right? So we talk about time series. I think Tony even mentioned something about time series. And yeah, I look around as, as a sort of meta analyst and seeing all the different analysts, what they're talking about, all the vendors, what they're talking about. Time series is everywhere these days, because guess what? It really matters to know what is the, the life cycle of this process. 
where do we place the markers in the timeline for behavior that really matters? And Tony talked about real-time data too. And I've seen this uh, intent data stuff in our space for a while now, because let's face it, the vendors who are selling analytical software, typically it's not super cheap. It's going to be 50 grand to a million bucks or something, depending upon the size of the organization. So one good lead can mean 50 grand to a million bucks, right? So it's, but you have to know when, like all this retargeting stuff that we see, it's funny because, you know, they're trying to sell you stuff you already bought because it's not, of course, running through one system, right? If it ran through one system, they would know, oh, he already bought those shoes. You don't have to advertise those shoes anymore, right? So th these are just some of the challenges that you see out there, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, so with, with the Intent Platform, um, Intent Data Cloud, we're essentially, um, we're measuring organizational content consumption habits to make determinations based on uh, white papers that employees are reading, webinars that are being registered for, attended, um, on-site downloads, email marketing metrics, uh, landing page analytics, and, and even social listening. To, we're using this information and synthesizing it um, to, to come up with a way to determine and predict which companies are currently researching certain types of, of technology solutions. So one of our clients, for example, Cisco, uh, they sell an umbrella security solution uh, for endpoint security for organizations. Uh, if we have one company and we have multiple employees for the same company downloading, researching endpoint security at any given time, indicating mm -hmm. that they have a buying time frame, that they have a budget in place, um, these are all markers that, that set off alarms and, and trigger our intent. Um, before we can do any of this, it kind of goes back to, you know, the way I was trained, which is just classical statistical analysis, uh, you know, multiple regression models to really determine what actually creates intent, what actually signals intent, because there are a lot mm -hmm. of things that we might think signals intent, and, and maybe it doesn't as much as some of the other things. So, so running these models and simulations, determining what the factors are, weighing the factors properly, mm -hmm. and then using that to, to score each company and, and do so uh, in real time. Yeah, and I'll give, uh, we're almost up to a break here, but I'll give one fun example. Again, at that MarTech conference that I went to a couple of years ago, there's a company called Vanilla Soft, which took, well, I think it's an absolutely fascinating approach in terms of how you govern the workflow, like day to day. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do in a minute? What am I going to do in 20 minutes, et cetera? That's, a, that's still a difficult thing to determine, right? And, and salespeople typically like to cherry pick, oh, I'm going to call Bob today, or I'll work on this account, that account. <laughs> what Vanilla Soft did is said, no, no, no. We're going to tap into all of your CRM technologies, your Salesforce, your Clickstream data, whatever the case may be. And then this engine, an AI engine, sits there and crawls across that information, and it tells the salesperson who to call next. Point being, if a bunch of people from GE are on your website right now looking around, it's going to bump that GE contact to the top of the queue, so you focus on that now. That's some really interesting stuff that takes information from all these different systems and optimizes a decision point about what the salesperson does next, right? So just cool stuff out there, folks. Look them up. Don't touch that dial. Be right back with the roundtables. You are listening to DM Radio. NS1 has a singular focus to deliver the best application traffic, intelligence, and automation technologies in the market so companies can build the better future. All right. The most innovative companies in the world so rely we on all have NS2 two. The last two go by so fast, you guys are going to blink and it's going to be over. So, uh, Kenya, I'll throw it back to you first. Uh, anything particularly you want me to throw at you when we come back? Oh, man. There's so many points that everybody brought up that I was like, oh, I'd love for this to be a discussion. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> And I can try to step back so y'all can kind of chit chat too. I mean, I I definitely want to touch on the data integrity piece um, and all these legacy systems that are trying to keep up with the Joneses and update their their systems to the cloud, not knowing what to do for second or third. Um, right. And yeah, that. I mean, right now at Microsoft, that's one of my biggest projects, moving a legacy system into a newer platform, um, and it is a mess. 
and you know we lose data along the way we lose the like good information and, and um yeah i'm i'm definitely open to whatever that's okay just, that sounds good I, I so I'll throw it to, have an open conversation <laughs> yeah let's do that i'll throw it first over to you and then tony and then kimberly feel free to chime in and, and paul and then if you can stick around for eight more minutes we'll do that podcast bonus segment but this is obviously top of mind for everyone involved that vanilla soft software sounds really cool it's it does. <laughs> I thought it was just fascinating. Just yeah. take that decision right out of the salesperson's yeah. hands. Like, nope, go. we're going to tell it. you what to do. <laughs> and it sounds like a lot of it, it. You don't necessarily need great input data from the salespeople because you don't always get that. You know, right. uh, sometimes you're getting, you know, that's the thing, right? Yeah. That's the thing. It used to always be just my estimation. This is 90% chance close, 80% based on just personal bias <laughs> and nothing right. else. Right. Right. Yep. Exactly. I feel like it's new age to actually rely on the data. Yeah, right. <laughs> what a concept, right? <laughs> Too funny. All right, we still got about two minutes left. It is funny that companies build these models, these these data driven models, and then they just don't use them. Right. So they uh, they do it just to do it, and then it's it's almost like when people do clinical you know, clinical trial and they're, they're looking for a certain result and sometimes they don't get the result they want, but they still have to publish it. The company doesn't have to use it, you know, and right. that's, that's one of the uh, troubling things to me. You know, if you're going to, you're going to go through all the time and, and work, you know, give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> give it a shot. Well, a lot, lots of interesting things are happening with in the data science space with um, mm -hmm. these data science platforms and being able to have your challenger models just running in the background and then boop, pop it up to production when you need to. That is, uh, you know, that's some pretty compelling stuff. That is a, if you can fish that topic in there, I have so many things to say. There. All right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll throw that, I'll throw that over to you because we're talking about analytics and, and cycles, virtuous circles, you know. That's the whole idea. No one even needs to all right. And in minutes, we'll tell you all about some additional new Medicare benefits for you, like dental, vision, hearing, transportation, and more. Call us. Now we're just. We'll explain all your new. You can Medicare see that the studio, what they're doing these days. We just started this uh, about like two months ago. Is they're doing TV style treatments on the visuals. So when this is all done, we'll have not just the audio for the radio shows, but we'll have all the visual, all the visuals as well. And then we have a show called Future Proof uh, that's now in about seven markets, an actual TV show. So how's that for old school, baby? That's 800-253-8126. Paid for by 65 Plus Medicare. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio, talking with a whole roster of analytics experts, Kenya Davis of DAA and Microsoft. I'll throw this over to you. you know, the data science world is so much more mature today than it was five years ago. You've got a whole bunch of different platforms out there. All, of course, all the big vendors are, are working in that space as well. And what's really exciting is that, talk about fostering virtuous circles, now you can have not just your production model, so the predictive model that's working at this moment, but you've got your challenger models waiting in the wings for whenever that production model starts to fade because yep. behavior changes, right? COVID changes all, all this behavior significantly. And that's some pretty exciting stuff. But what do you think, Kenya? So I, as I mentioned before, my background is experimentation. And with that, um, it really drives that need for for everyone to rely on their data science uh, partners. Like we have all this access to these new platforms and, um, and to our data and to our analytics capabilities, but having access is one thing, knowing how to use it is another. Um, and I believe that, you know, those tools and that, um, that, that scientific logic that goes into being um, a data scientist and, and that degree that they look at the data is needed before we make the decisions that we do. Um, we're starting to see the drop in the values of, of just opinions. Like you've been in the field for 20 years and because they said to do it, everyone goes with it. Um, that's going away. And now um, people are being challenged um, in a good way. And this is something that should be embraced. Um, and so when it comes to 
um, data science and, and how analytics is shifting, um, we're starting to see these different models, predictive models being in, injected into marketing strategies um, for it to allow for marketing to not only experiment with what they think they know, um, but to also compensate for when, they, when they're starting to see deviation from the customer. Um, if anything that we've learned in the past few years, COVID has changed behavior. And I think the mentality was that, oh, one day it'll, come, it'll you know, go back to normal and, and people will do what they used to do. And they're not, and they won't, and they right. never will. People don't want to go to the office anymore. People don't want to um, sit and stare at something for hours or do the same uh, strategies day in and day out. They want right. something more exciting. They want, they want real, uh, tangible, like, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, results. And with that, um, we have to look at our data in such a different way. It's not just about collecting it, but it's interpreting it. Um, and using it for a better use. Yep, I love it. I love it. And, and Tony, as uh, as she was talking there, I was thinking to myself, the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion, right? That we've been uh, like defaulting to for so many years now. I think a lot of that's going to start going away too, because the senior executives. I'll throw this over to Tony Ayaz. The senior executives know this now, right? You had better know your data. You had better know your analytics. It's table stakes these days. So we're, I think, we're moving much closer to being truly data-driven, but what do you think, Tony? Yeah, uh, before I answer that, I slightly disagree with Kenya, but in a joking way. I miss the traffic and looking for parking and driving to the office. I just miss it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but with that said, yeah, I mean, it's it's all driven. Like, I'll, I'll kind of give an example. Maybe, Riley, I saw something on the news today about Equifax, and it basically said Equifax can get access to your pay stub or more or less exactly what you're making and then share that information with third parties that can do whatever. And now you can go to Equifax website and basically say, I don't want this information shared, right? And then block it. But then if you're gonna go refinance your house, apply for credit, guess what? Then you can't. So then you have to go back through a process to release it. So, so this data-driven world is a double-edged sword, right? Because on one hand, that personal income information could mean the difference between you getting approved for something. Right. And, and if it's not there, then you wouldn't get it approved for it. But then how do you protect it? So it all comes back down to how do you kind of really, you know, it's about I'm really, you know, kind of on this privacy aspect of things of, of that. I think the missing link to pure data analytics and data science is privacy. So I think we, we you know, the data science side, there's a lot of this AI automation and this data is there and the world's going to take over and you're going to get all. I don't know. I maybe I'm alone in this view, but I like to I burst that bubble slightly because first problem that data scientists have is access to data. Mm -hmm. And so when they can access that data, then they build the machine learning models. The machine learning models don't come before the humans. The humans have to build the machine learning models. And so if they can build that in a privacy centric perspective, like to, to cover these point guardrails and how they look at the data, then they already know whatever they build and whatever model they come up with is going to be accurate, right? All we've done today and kind of my slight boring experience in big data analytics is that, you know, we're taught like being my, uh, to collect everything. And then we're like, oh yeah, then it's all in a relational database or it's an Oracle. Now it's this big data thing. Now dump it into a data warehouse. And then it's like, okay, go fish it. So I think we have to all evolve around what, what the cloud leaders are doing today to make everybody data centric or data driven, which is they're collecting all this information and making it easy for you. But all of the cloud native architectures and technologies that are out there are spitting subsets of this event or timestamp data that can paint a picture of what's going on. You don't need to collect everything and then pay somebody very point. expensive to go, well, take out the stuff I don't need put this other stuff in it, where technology is going and what we're working on is route the data, just like your home router filter of what you need, where it needs to be with all those things in it and leave the human interpretation out of what should be private or not. That's interesting. It's almost like an ELT approach for, for data at scale, right? Instead of extract, transform, load, you just you extract, load, and then transform and use whatever you want. That might be a bit of a loose analogy, but uh, 
the point being you're, you're taking a different architectural perspective to, uh, to managing the data and you don't have to do things the old way, right? That's one of the nice things, and maybe I'll throw this over to Kimberly, about streaming analytics and analyzing data that's on the move instead of waiting it for it to persist somewhere in a warehouse and you know, two weeks later you're doing your analysis. Streaming analytics is, is very hot for that particular reason. What do you think, Kimberly? Oh, absolutely. And here's the, the one of the advantages of being a part of the community is that because things are changing so quickly, you do need to constantly stay up to date on all of the new information, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so much information. There's so many changes. There's so much information out there. By being a part of the community, it's kind of better vetted. I'm going to put it that way. So Yes, I could listen to uh, a webinar that's put on by one of the vendors, but it's go that's going to be vendor centric. And mm -hmm. through an affiliation with DAA, you've got an opportunity to be tapped into real time education, uh, just in time education, but it's not specific, always specific to a vendor. It's more generalized and it's vetted by the community. So your colleagues have said, yes, that's good. That's good information. I want more of that. Or this is not so good. Let's let that go and let's bring in something else. So yes, it's a fast moving, quickly changing industry. And there's an opportunity through DAA affiliation. I think there's an opportunity for you to stay plugged in, stay up to date, um, even as it's changing. Yeah, and uh, you, you referenced something, this just-in-time knowledge and education. Wonderful stuff. We had uh, Nick Jewell on our show uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and he was at Alteryx for a very long time, but he's actually launched a new service where they're doing exactly that kind of thing, where they're doing lots of little bite-sized bits mm -hmm. about how to design a data model, datacurious.ai. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend anyone check that out because uh, you have to stay on top of stuff, man, and it changes quickly. You know, Boy, one, of the, one of the downsides of, of publishing directions for things is that you forget to unpublish it when the directions change. I can't yeah. tell you how many times I've had that where you're trying to troubleshoot something. It's like, go to the file menu into the second option. Like, well, there is no more second option. Like, what, right. you know, what exactly. am I supposed to be doing here? Right. It's, uh, it's tough. It's hard to do. But we right. almost, we're almost out of time. Got a minute and a half left. I'll throw it over to Paul Gunther for some thoughts, you know, we're part of the problem and the solution too, right? People and how we leverage these technologies, what we do, how we share and learn. So we always have to kind of continue to up our game as well about what's available and how to do things, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, no doubt about it. And going back to uh, what Kenya mentioned earlier, you know, behaviors are always changing. Um, they changed significantly in 2020 and they haven't changed back, not much right. at least. Um, we, we're always doing internal analysis of our email marketing. We're sending millions of emails out on a monthly basis and everything changed in 2020. Um, hmm. Everything from optimal send times, you know, to, to get the, the highest open rates and it used to lay somewhere in the 10 a.m., 11 a.m. local time region um, to optimal send days, which were always on Thursdays and Wednesdays. Um, everything's changed because everyone's working at home. Um, everyone's right. got a different routine. Uh, they're not just going and sitting at their office desk and looking at email for an hour, drinking coffee. It's like, everything's different <laughs> every day. And so, you know, with that, um, you have to change. And when we look at it and we did an analysis just in December of last year, we're seeing people engaging with email on Fridays on a level that they never have in the past. Um, yeah. Fridays was always, yeah. Yeah. That's a big deal too. And I, I'm in that world as well. I've been doing track digital marketing, email marketing for over 20 years, which is about three times the average veteran's duration. But then we'll pick up the podcast bonus segment up next. You've been listening to DM Radio. In the know. Hey, if you guys want to stick around, can you do eight more minutes? Absolutely. All right, I'll start with Kenya. Let me just go quiet for about 10 seconds and I'll just dive right back in. Hold on. <clears throat> okay, folks, time for the podcast bonus segment. What an all-star cast. We've been talking today to Paul 